is always a pleasure to ever be asked. The opportunity is an honor to be here at Grayson. I, I think it's great to see all the little young young ones here with us today and going to be in here with us in the sound of children. It always makes me so happy to hear that. I know it does you too. And and it's good that in your prayer you will proclaim the Lord's grace into your prayer. In fact, I really appreciate that. And the idea that uh, we're just, just thankful throughout it all and thankful to be here in the comfortable buildings that we have. The, the lesson today was given to me, and I'm moving things around again, was Jesus, but as Emmanuel, God with us. And, and anybody worth their salt and study would always want to do the context, right? So it's a, take the idea of, of Matthew and turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, if you will. This is where the, the reading will come from. And in Matthew, I think it's so neat that... Matthew, you know the gospel accounts had a certain audience in mind, and Matthew was writing to the, to the Jew, but one of the things they'd be very interested in would be in the genealogy. And here you see the genealogy is traced all the way back to Adam, and that promise that was given that through his seed all the nations of the world would be blessed, right? And so we see that all traced down to Joseph in this context. What's also neat is that if you go to Luke chapter 4, I don't want you to turn there, you'll see that it's genealogy listed there at the beginning, but it comes down to Mary. And it's just neat seeing the genealogies of both the promise given to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and then once again to David and knowing that both parents, of course Joseph being a stepfather, right, but are still listed for all time in the, the actual promise being fulfilled of the prophecy that was given all the way back to Abraham. That's just neat how they start. I think it's, a, it's really neat because with that, we're going to see where we pick up in verse 18. Verse 18. And it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with, with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all that was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took him his wife and did not know her till she had brought her forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. I'm pretty sure, off the top of my head, I didn't even have this in my notes, I think it's Acts chapter 4, verse 12, that talks about there's no other name among heaven given unto men by which we must be saved. The name Jesus. And here you are saying, who is the Christ, Right? Let me find this little thing. When you had the idea of when Scott called me and said, hey, we're going to do a lesson on Christ and all the many ways that he's been mentioned in the Bible. Which one do you want? And I don't know if you can see it there, but the idea is there's a few to choose from. Okay? I found a couple different charts, but it's like, wow, which one will it be? But Mark is one that's always in his gospel account, right to the point, straightforward. But in my context right here in Matthew 18, he goes on to say, let me tell you, this is the birth of Jesus in the very next word, Christ. He gets to the point real quickly of what's so special about this one, and we're going to see the prophets fulfilled, is that he's the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one they then should be looking for, right? All the different genealogies led up to say, hey, he's here. He's here. And so you can see the many different names that can be used. But I want to look at a couple here. This is great. I don't get to see, and I hope I was asking Scott if you can see above me, right? My head's not too big. Okay. <laughs> he said he will just look around it. He told me, thanks. But when we see the name Jesus, I know my lesson was given to Emmanuel, but as you can see, I should warn you to buckle up because I do talk fast. <laughs> but we're going to talk about both a little bit because I think it's in this context that it's so important. And when I looked at y'all's brochure, I didn't see anyone that actually took the name Jesus as well. Just what is so neat about the name Jesus? So that Jesus we talk about in a minute 
is ideas about his purpose. That name is going to tell what his divine mission was and what he was going to do. The next name, Emmanuel, that's going to talk about his person. And what I mean by that, you know, there's one God, right? We have three distinct personalities, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So his person would be his divine nature. He had a divine purpose. It was to meet the Jesus, for he shall save him for our soul. So if you know the name Jesus in the New Testament, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but I don't speak Koine Greek, but you would see. You would see. But I'm guessing. It's close. But the name in the Old Testament, Yahshua. And you get the name, the same name that was of Joshua in the Old Testament, the same name that is Jesus in the New Testament. And to me, that's kind of neat. But what's it mean? God is salvation. That's what the name means. So Jesus, just the name Jesus means God is salvation. And if you know types and antitypes, if the antitype is Jesus, and the type is Joshua, or the shadow is Joshua, Joshua's purpose was to lead the people to the promised land. He was going to save them. He was going to deliver them out of the bondage and pick up where Moses left off, get them out of the wilderness, and actually be able to take them to the promised land of Canaan, right? But Jesus, is he not taking all those that are being delivered from the bondage of sin to another promised land? And what we're looking for there is a Savior to deliver to heaven. And that's new to me. I don't know. That's free. It wasn't with the title I was given, Emmanuel, but I thought it was neat. It's just the idea. You're probably like, yeah, yeah, we know that. But you shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For right there it says, he shall save his people from their sins. What's important right there? Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. That's very significant. God is our Savior. Is it not? You know, even Job and all the trials of your prayer, that we hope comes that comfort, that peace that we can have in Jesus through trials and tribulations. Did not Job... And he prayed to God, let me see which that there was a redeemer, someone I could talk to. And then here in the times we have Jesus. And we're going to see what makes him so amazing with the name Emmanuel, God with us. But let's just take just a moment and talk about Jesus as the one who will save people from their sins. If Jesus had a mission statement, what would you think it might be? It might be like a Bible class. I think sometimes Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost, right? That was his purpose. That's his mission. Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom, which it said for all, but for many. Though his sacrifice is available to all mankind, not all will be saved, that is, right? And only many in all the years, but still, how many more do not? That's sad. The name Jesus, when you hear it, what do you think about? That God is a savior. God, Jehovah, he is salvation. He's going to save people from their sins, but I want to talk about a few ways in which he does that. He saves us first from the guilt of sin. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. You ever feel like, and you should, when you're raised up in by the word guiding you, that when you make a mistake, there's something in you that goes off and says that wasn't right? That's a good form of guilt. That something's been trained by the word of God that the way you act, the way what you do, what you see, or what you said, is it according to what scripture has asked for God's desire and demand for us to do? And so I think the idea that Jesus came and he was the one that can take away uh, the guilt of sin. We'll talk a little bit more of that in a second. The second part is that he would save us from the power of sin. The third one, and I'm getting ahead of myself, he'll save us from the consequences of sin. And the last one, he's going to save us from even the very presence of sin. When that day comes and he returns or our last breath taken and you're faithful in Christ, you'll go to paradise. But one day we're going to be reunited in a place where sin cannot be. And he's going to save us from that. We're in a world today where I think Ethan said many, many years ago that Satan's best device was he made people think he didn't exist. That he was some little pitchfork cartoon or something. But now he's flamboyantly bold. And it doesn't matter if you believe in him or not. It's pretty obvious that he exists. <laughs> and so the idea that we will just someday be re-saved, delivered from even the very presence of sin or Satan or selfishness. So the first one Jesus saves is going to be from the guilt of sin. I've already said by God demonstrating his own love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. 
he died for us. Verse 9 says that. I mean, uh, verse 6 says the ungodly. Um, I don't know if you do it, and I, I don't know where this came from. I think somebody has telepathy in here. But did you ever do the communion, and you talk about why it's so important each and every first day of the week, and you focus solely on what Christ did and that sacrifice for you? And sometimes when we do that, if we remember all that he went through before he even got to the cross, and even on the cross, when they're yelling out, how can this man save us? He could save himself first. And the ridicule and mocking. And yet, what did Christ say in return to that? Eventually, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. To me, that's that's the amazing thing that he knew that we would be guilty, but his main purpose was seeking to save that which was lost. And what he was seeking is to, is to restore that relationship that mankind once had with God. And all the dispensations, we still continue to see that there's a way that God wants to draw close to his people, yet through our sin, we're separated, and he's constantly like the father, the prodigal son, is waiting and watching. And you know that God is as close or as far as way as you want him to be. He's always there. But based on our sin, what does it say in James 4, 7? That if you draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. He's always ready to be there. But here's a guilt. If you've been forgiven, do you know anybody that's been forgiven, washed by the water, gave a baptism, comes out and walks in the newness of life and still holds on to the guilt for past decisions? You ever met somebody like that? I looked in the mirror for a long time for a person like that. And I had somebody tell me one time, but Jeff, you think that you were forgiven, right? Yes. But you're still holding on to that guilt that's stifling your growth. You're not actually realizing that Christ came to wash that away. Yes, you can't pass that sin, and you're not. Then move on and continue to grow. Because if you're saying that you're still feeling that guilt from past decisions after being washed by the blood, then you're basically blaspheming. I was like, blaspheming? He's say, you're saying that you're, by your actions and that guilt that you think Jesus' blood is not enough for your sin. That God would send his son and it wasn't enough to forgive you? How dare you say that, Jeff? It would hit me hard. How dare I say that? How dare we hold on to the guilt that can slow us up from being all that God wants us to be because we are forgiven. That's the great thing about in God. He saves us from the guilt. Let it go. Learn from our past. Don't forget it. It helps us to move forward. You know, I couldn't imagine the guilt that Peter had. John chapter 20, when he was asked three times, Peter, do you love me? I wonder what he was thinking about. He was asked three times, what else did he do three times? He denied him three times. You think the guilt was still to him? Said, go feed my sheep. The next way he saves us, of course, is in the power of sin. If you don't like Romans chapter 8, I don't know what you would like. But I love how it begins there, right? There's no condemnation. Those that are in Christ Jesus, there's no con there's no judgment that can be eternally separate us. There's no condemnation that men can say upon us. Oh, there'll be men said. In this same chapter, they're going to be like saying things like, uh, if God be for us, who can be against us? We're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. But if God be for us, who can be against us? Well, in the world, quite a lot of people. In the long run, it's not going to matter if you're right with God. But you're still going to have to feel the pressures of what it's like for people being against you, right? <laughs> it comes with it. First Timothy 3.12, those that desire to live godly may be suffer persecution. Will. You know, we know a preacher that would tell me, if you're not suffering any persecution, are you living godly yet? <laughs> if you're not getting something where somebody says, Something, and it's like, what's the most persecution we receive in this day and time? Call us a Bible thumper? Holy roller? I mean, I'd say thank you. I don't know. <laughs> we should wear some of these names as a badge of honor for doing it to bring God glory, right? But he can, the power of sin, no condemnation. Look at the verse 2, what it really means in this context. That through Jesus, for the law of the Spirit and the life of Christ, Jesus has made me free from the law of of sin and death. There's a lot of natural laws in this world. But sin brings forth death. And in Christ, like it's what the Romans 6.23, where the wages of sin is death, what if it was sad if there was a period there? If we could ever do anything about it, if there was a period. But it goes on to say that the gift of God through His Son Jesus Christ is eternal life, right? It's eternal life. And so there's always a way that we can be free from the power that sin has over us. 
we get the guilt, let it go. You can be forgiven. You can still hold on to that. Let's talk about it afterward. If you've got the power of sin, because sin can be very overpowering. Satan is very overpowering. If you're going to try to take Satan on by yourself, you're going to lose. But if you have Christ, you have his body, other ones in your corner encouraging you, you're going to be much better. <laughs> you don't have a chance if you have Jesus. He's already won the victory. So let's have the power that's in Christ Jesus. The last one, or the third one, is he saves us from the consequences of sin. Much more now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of him. That's what the consequences of sin is. It's wrath. Who wants to see the wrath of God? Therefore, knowing the terror of God, we persuade men to change, right? God's wrath is not vengeful, even though vengeance is his. God's wrath is righteous indignation. He's angry and he's mad for the right reason. And if God is mad and he says, the worst thing he is mad is you will not inherit heaven, well, they say, how can an all benevolent, all loving God send anyone to heaven? And the answer to that is he doesn't. He doesn't. He chooses. He gives us every reason not to go there. But when people choose to live apart from Christ and be washed by his blood or walk in the light continuously, they're the ones choosing to go there. God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of sin. God's law will suffer and not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 9. But it's in his blood that he saves us from that consequence because there's not one of us here that's not deserving of the eternal death. Hebrews 9, 27. He appointed all men to die once, and then what? The judgment. Right? No one's going to be free of that unless Jesus comes back. But you better be in Christ when he comes back also. Right? Where will you be found? And he saves us from that wrath of not having his blood to cover us. It's like the Passover's coming, and with him we have the blood over this doorpost. You know, so we have that. We're in the ark that Noah had. We're in that place of salvation if you're in Christ. Those are pretty basic analogies and the last one from the very presence is appointed for all men to die there's that verse again but after this the judgment so christ offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him and will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation i did a a study of revelation and it's the study I'm doing at a nursing home, and it's, it's pretty repetitive. It has to be that way sometimes, right? But it's good for me to get to go over it and over it and over it. But the idea that so many people on TV are steeped in this premillennialistic thought and this idea of heaven, and we study in that that there's no sin can enter in. There's, there's no tears in heaven, right? There's none of these things. But then they bring up ideas. But look at Job. What did Satan say to God? He was going to and fro. But when you read in Revelation, I'm going to hold up a topic. The idea that that's long since been happened with the death at the, at the cross. God, Satan doesn't have a presence with God anymore. He doesn't have that audience anymore, but he does have power here on earth. He doesn't go to and fro on earth. He goes to and fro on earth, on earth now, not from earth. But now in this, in days, he's going, he's like, what's it say in uh, 1 Peter 5, 9, that he's our adversaries roaming the, by the old world like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It's just the idea that, yes, there is a place, paradise and eventually heaven, where not even the very presence of an accuser can even be a part of. But in God's plan, at one time, I couldn't imagine his holiness because he's a pure eyes can't behold evil. Know what that means? He can't look favorably upon it. God sees the good and the bad. He, he, he knows. And he even allowed that accommodative language or the very presence of Satan because he gave us the big power of choice and free will. And with that, we can choose to do good. And with that, we can listen to that old serpent right and choose to do wrong but i can't wait to a place where that temptation does not even enter in it's going to be a place where sin has no bearing on us so that's a lot to be said about the name jesus right that was the introduction <laughs> it's going to be longer than the other one thank you for your courtesy laugh <laughs> Uh, but Emmanuel, this is where it gets rich because, you know, I thought about his name shall be Emmanuel when I first read this. I've not always been a Christian. I've only been about 12 years or so. But the idea is, why don't we ever call him Emmanuel, right? I mean, you, you don't often. But it's all, once again, about the prophecy going back to Isaiah 7, 14, right? 
It's the idea that there it says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, right? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. That's what's being retold in the prophecy given in Matthew. It's, it's really, really rich. The idea there that his name has an historical associations, kind of like the way I did with Jesus and Joshua, but Emmanuel fulfilling the prophecy that was recorded of back in the days of Isaiah. And the, what's so significant is when it's translated in Matthew, is how many here know Hebrew? Okay. We took a little bit of school, but that is so hard. You talk about warping your mind. you got to read from the right to the left. You try doing that. You can't. It's so hard. It's like, you want to go this way. It's, anyway. But Emmanuel, anything with the E-L means God, right? So that's the L. But the idea that here God is with us, do we really understand that? That now we're talking about Jesus' person of the Godhead, that he is God. He is deity. He was the 100% flesh that was born. And what a cute baby he must have been. <laughs> but still 100% God. And Luke 2.52 is that he had to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. There's some growth time. And man, but I'm telling you, it's just amazing that God would be with us. Because even in Isaiah verse 9, verse 6, I hope I have it on here. I don't know if I put it on here. That's the translation. <clears throat> what a neat screen here. Okay. For unto us a child is born. You, ever, you know this verse, right? We call him Wonderful. We call him Counselor. Yes, we can call Jehovah, Jesus, that. But you ever wonder about when it says, not Mighty God, but the next one. Everlasting Father. That to me just stands out, the Prince of Peace. That here this child is being born. The government, this new kingdom will be upon his shoulder. A kingdom that's going to be across any nation the world over. A kingdom that will always stand. You're going to call him Wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. That though there's three distinct personalities, it comes from one essence. Hero Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Not meaning in number, but in unity. One supreme essence that created all things, and Jesus was there. If someone tries to teach that Jesus was God's first creation, there's a Greek word for that, baloney. <laughs> okay? I'm telling you, he's always been here. He's always been there. He's always will be there. It's what the, the ever-present, always-existing, eternal one. And so it's the idea that here we are in this name, Emmanuel, is trying to say, that not only is he going to save his people, there's been earthly people that do great things to save those that follow. But he was saving us from the spiritual death and separation. And now Emmanuel is the great thing is that he's with us. That he always is, will always be with us. It has the idea, you know, here's a great one. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. What was the word? Was God. Was God. He always is God. Well, this is speaking in the past tense. John's going to the very beginning. In the beginning, all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. I don't think I have it in here, but about verse 14 of that same chapter. And that word became flesh in what dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Truly full of God's grace, seen in the flesh. How many times in the great Son of Mount, he says, you've heard the top, and I say unto you this. I'm telling you, this is the root of it. I'm going to get to the heart of the matter. You're doing things on an outward sign. I want to get to your heart. This word became flesh. God was with us. And to me, that's amazing. He's um, He shared the glory of the Father in the incarnation when he became flesh. But how about the times when it said things like the I am statements? Those are great studies in them all. But this one always blew me away. When they're giving him a hard time because Joseph was such a good father in this chapter. Because when you're betrothed in that first century... In that time period, and your wife was pregnant, what would that meant? Not good. And it shows in this context that other people knew about it too. These Pharisees in this context say, at least we know who our father is. Ooh, what are they saying to Jesus? That Joseph wasn't your daddy. They weren't even married yet. Your mom, call his mom something probably. These are tough things that people are saying. But he doesn't get wild up. 
He just says, Abraham was glad to see my day. And they started getting puffed up. How could he? You're not even 40 years old. How could you say Abraham was glad to see your day? Before Abraham was, I am. If there was ever a mic just dropped, Jesus just did it. Bam. And they couldn't take it. Ripping their clothes, they couldn't take it. Why? Because he's saying he is God. They say, Jesus never said I am God. He didn't have to. He wanted to come out of our mouths, but he didn't deny it. You say that I'm a king? Yes. You say rightly. For my kingdom is not of this world. He got to say it because he wants to show it. It is up to us to believe it. And how dare we not believe it? But here are the I am statements. If you study the Old Testament at all, the ego in me, the I am that I am when Moses talks to the burning bush. What's he saying before Abraham was I am? I'm God. It talks about the glory of God. Some people are mistaken when they quote the Lord's Prayer of Matthew 6. And, then, and you know, oh, Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. All those things that we, sometimes I remember saying in football in high school many years ago. That's a model prayer, yes, teaching them how to pray. But if you want to know what the Lord's Prayer is, read John 17. That whole chapter is a prayer that will just melt your heart. He first prays even for himself. That he could glorify God in this time of trial. And he's praying so much at this time that you'll see that his tears are like sweat of blood. I mean, his, excuse me, you know what I mean, right? His sweat was as of blood. He's praying so earnestly and hard. But he's praying that at this time, glorify me together. Why? Because I had that glory with you before all this began. It's, it's amazing that Jesus, in his prayer, he's depending on whatever translation you have I don't think I have it in this one here but in your translation of Hebrews chapter 1 when it says in various times and in various way God spoke to the fathers through the prophets but in these last days has spoken to us through his son what's your version say in that sometimes I like the ESV when it says something like the radiance of his glory and the exact imprint of his nature I don't know I want to see what the that's the one I I really turn to, turn to Hebrews 1. You want to see something about glory. I think it says, In the last days spoke to his son, appointed all things to whom he made the worlds, and being in the brightness of his glory in the express image of his person. Does anybody have the ESV? Does anybody use that? Do you, do you, would you read that loud? What's it say? Yes. He is the radiant of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. The foundation says amen. amen. And go ahead, go ahead. Okay. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Beautiful. Thank you. I, how dare I cut you off because that's all I wanted was verse 3a. But, I mean, the whole thing is wonderful. You know, the idea that he's not just the creator. He's the sustainer. And how does the, the world even be sustained? By the word. And what's Jesus? The word. And all the different things, how these things kind of overlap. I don't know. I'm a simple man. It just blows my mind how he's trying to say dig deep into this and see how beautiful and rich is the radiance of his glory. What do you think of when you hear, hear the word radiance? You know, it brings to mind something like to me. In Romans 12, 1 or 2, that, that my beloved brethren, by the tender mercies of God, I beseech you that you give yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, being not conformed to this world, but what? Being transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove it as that pure and acceptable and holy will of God. I think that's not the Jeff's version. But the idea that that transform is the same word we get in Greek for metamorphosis. It's something that's so beautiful that, you, that comes from the within that can definitely take over and show on the outside. That Jesus is with us. And guess what? Jesus is in us. Do you not know that Jesus is in you? 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Test yourselves, he says. It's just amazing that he's not just with us. He is in us. He's for us. He's not against us. And here, the idea with Abraham and the glory, possessing the radiance of glory and exact imprint. He's declared with the Son of God by power, right? Romans 1, 3, and 4 says, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power. You sin say it. How did he show it? By the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. 
There's many things Jesus did in that he would have my attention. I'm pretty shallow. If I had been the 5,000 people getting fed, <laughs> I would have thought that was pretty cool. I like food. Can you imagine to keep going? But seriously, raising Lazarus after four days, the other people had been raised. God has shown his power doing that. Even in Ezekiel and different ones, some dry bones persons were reincarnated. That's amazing. But Jesus is the one that laid down his life and took it up himself. God, by God's glory, gave him that authority that no man could take his life. He laid it down. So with that, he could take it up again. That's amazing to me. That God was there in the flesh. And even after the resurrection, over 500 have seen this, have, were said to have seen him. But even in the upper room, when Thomas was even able to touch him bodily, see the holes, put his finger in them, my Lord, my God. He's with us. He'll always be with us. And so the rest of that goes on uh, to say, um, to show that he was God, another great passage, I don't have it up here, is Philippians chapter 2, right? And about verse 5, he goes on to say that he humbled himself. He took on the form of man. Some people have said that Jesus, leaving the essence of being God and becoming a man, is so much greater of a jump than us becoming a worm. It's just, there's not even a comparison because his holiness was so awesome in power to take on the form of a man and yet he humbled himself to not be somebody that the world lifted up what's Isaiah 53 say no one was a not comely that no one would desire him just for his looks he wasn't rich we know that because his parents had to give turtle doves as their sacrifice he was born and then he humbled himself not just the poverty and the hard way he had to live not ever married I don't know how he made it without his helper <laughs> but seriously he, he lived a tough life. But he humbled himself to the point of death. And not just any but death. The worst one possible that's ever been there. The crucifixion. They perfected death. And he did that for you and I. And if that's not being on your side, I don't know what is. And so the controversy, if you try to sum it up, goes on to Colossians 10. For in him dwells some of the Godhead. I love when I try to do that. People won't let me. And they go, no, uh Not some. All of the Godhead bodily. I'm thinking, how can they have the power so much so? And a little girl was saying one time that says, God is so big that he has the whole world in his hands. Is that right, BBS? Yes. But you said God dwells in us? Yes. But wouldn't he shine through? I mean, <laughs> he should. That's a good thing out of the mouth of babe. We, he should. He should be so full of you that he shines through. That you can't contain the God that's inside you. It's going to be something that's, you're glowing. I don't know, when you see a lovely woman with their child, do they not glow when something so important? It's like they're glowing. Something so precious is inside. Shouldn't that be us for Jesus? I don't know. I'm just going for the posture. <laughs> I'm telling you, let us be full of the Spirit. You know, full of wine, dissipation, but let us be full of the Spirit. Y'all, I think it's so great that we're in the church that, that everything has to be done according to what the Bible says. But thus saith the Lord. But just because we have the truth of doctrine, don't ever let it be that you don't just saturate it all in the love and the welcomingness. And I feel that here at this congregation. I hope it's still a lot of the ones that come to our Bible Bowl. And I just hope that's always the way. I don't know why that came up. It just did. I want to get to the end. Do you want to strengthen the foundation of your hope? Who would say no? Would you want to experience, like your prayer, the peace and comfort that comes through and even through the trials of suffering? Who would say no? Who would want to? We all want that, right? When you think about the man Jesus, he was there to save you. What are you going to do with that man? There's going to come a time when I think it already was the gospel message with the world over. Wow. But through all the different things, people didn't repay them their knowledge and all the things Romans talks about. But I hear there's places even in the far country that don't have running water but have access to the internet. That blows my mind. They can go charge up a phone that are being sent over there, and there might be little things that have access to the internet. It's going to come a time, and it's already already there, that every single person will at least hear the name Jesus. What do you do next? If you want to strengthen your faith, go to the Word, for He is the Word, right? How does faith come? By hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. And how do we have that peace that surpasses all understanding? Well, prayer. But it's through him. His purpose was to seek and to save that which is lost. Let him work with you tonight. His person was deity. 
And I think the idea with Emmanuel is so good because I know people that think God's against them. Why me, God? Why is this all happening to me? Why is this happening? I, I am a good person. That's the world. That's not God, right? But if you can change that why me to why me, God? Why me, God? Because you sent your son to die for me. Does that change your thinking that you can handle all things? You can endure all things through Christ who gives you strength? Because whatever goes on in this world, it's just a trial. And we're going to be gone a lot longer than we're going to be here. <laughs> we're going to be there, wherever that there is, so much longer than we're going to be here. Don't let this here affect your there. <laughs> you know, and so I just call you to think about the suffering that comes with Emmanuel. Some people think he's against us. No, as in Romans 8, God is for us. He's there with us. He's for you. He's as far away as you want him to be. And if you're here on a Wednesday night, I know you think it's important to be close to the Lord and to be close to his body, the brethren. Once you see that, just encourage one another to see the day approaching. I love that our opening prayer was already including, bring us back again. Let that be in every prayer. Bring us back at the next appointed time. If you're not a Christian tonight, I know Scott and the other many men here would love to study with you. But let's take the opportunity any night. Maybe it's because we want to come forward in front of people they have places to go. They just got their power back. I know you got things to do, right? But don't let that hold you up from coming forward and asking for prayer. So I don't know how long I have, but I'm sure I went over. Whatever your need is, we ask you to come as we stand and sing.